Well, good morning, Bridges. It's uh, great to see you. And um, obviously, we're back in uh, the Bridges Worship Center. And uh, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a building. It is a body. But nevertheless, it's, um, it's good to be here, and it's good to have you join with us. Um, you know, last week we started a series of messages called Solace from the Psalms. And last week we looked at Psalm 42, and in a moment we're going to look at Psalm uh, chapter 139. But as I mentioned last week, uh, the word uh, solace means comfort and peace. And as we look around ourselves in the world today, uh, it might be a little bit difficult to see comfort and peace. And uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic and this week, unfortunately, in my country, we're in the midst of a lot of protests in the United States. And this past Thursday, I had the opportunity to gather with 16 uh, different men from 11 different countries, everywhere from Kazakhstan to Zimbabwe, obviously here um, in Brazil. Um, and it was a powerful time, and we were talking about Ephesians chapter 2. And before we get into Psalm 139, I wanted to read from Ephesians chapter 2 because I think it's such a relevant word for our times today. It says, For Christ himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through Jesus Christ we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. You know, the intent, the desire, and the design of God is that we would live as a single humanity. You know, I mentioned gathering with 16 different men from 11 different countries, but I don't believe that God looks at us through the lens or the filter or the eyes of countries or geopolitical borders or by our color or by our race, or by anything else other than creation of his that he wants to be one in him. Uh, Jesus Christ and the peace that he brings is the bar that we as Christ followers should all seek. So in these days, I just want to encourage us because there are so many other distractions right now going on in this world, and I just want to encourage us to look through the eyes of Christ, who does not see color, who does not see religious labels, but who sees the individual as someone for whom he died for and as someone who he loves and has created. So as we look at Psalm 139 uh, this morning, and I encourage you, if you have a Bible, uh, to take that and open to Psalm 139, because we're going to look at um, who God says we are, and we're going to look more specifically at four different reasons why we don't have reason to fear our future. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, but the reality is that God is already into our Monday. He is going to meet us in our Monday. He's going to meet us in our Tuesday. He knows what's going to be going on in our lives in July of next month and next year. And there's no reason for us, even in the midst of all the uncertainty that we're facing, to fear the future because God meets us there. Now, we're going to look at Psalm 139 in, in segments today, and I just want to give you a little bit of a warning. It's easy to read Psalm 139 and go on a big ego trip and to make Psalm 139 about yourself 
because it talks about we're, we're wonderfully made and God never leaves us and all of these, these beautiful things, but it's not about an ego trip. It's not about just you or just me. What this psalm is about is relationship with God and who we are in Him. And so that's what I want us to focus on, not just ourselves, but on who we are with God. And so let's begin in uh, Psalm 139, this journey in verse 1. David writes and says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to obtain. You know, the first reason that I believe why we don't need to fear our future is that God knows you intimately. I mean, did you hear what's being said here? He knows when you lie down and he knows when you rise up. He knows the thoughts that are on your mind. He knows everything about you and he knows you intimately. You know, if you're around Bridges at all for any length of time, you've probably heard me say, God doesn't do random. And I really believe that, that God does not do random. Everything is under his control, and he is sovereign. But there's another thing that I believe that God does not do, and that is casual. I don't believe that God does casual. I don't believe that God has created us in order to know us in a casual manner. He wants to know us intimately. He desires to know us um, to the very depths of who we are. Listen uh, to what this passage, what Jesus says from the Gospel of Matthew. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. This is amazing. Not only does God know the monumental of our lives, but he knows the trivial, the minutia of our lives, the very details Uh, of our lives, the number of hairs on our head. He knows every need that that we have. And then he says, um, he knows your need before you ask him. So the question might be, if God already knows what we need, why should we even ask? Why do we need to ask? Well, it's because God is more interested in the relationship than the request. He wants us to come to him because he desires for us to know him as intimately and deeply as he knows us. Again, from the Psalms 56 verse 8, it says, You, God, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle, and you have recorded each one in your book. You know, your suffering is not lost on God. The aches of your heart are not lost on God. The pain that you might be experiencing in these days is not lost on God. We don't need to fear our future because God knows us intimately. Let's go on in the psalm and beginning in verse 7. It says, Where can I go from your spirit, God? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. The second reason that we don't need to fear about our future is because God is with you constantly. He never leaves us never forsakes us. You know, in, in August of 1997, I experienced the most terrifying moment in my life to this point. Uh, I was with my family, and we were in downtown Hong Kong, and I lost 
my eight-year-old son. For about 10 minutes, I had no idea where he was, and fear just came all over me and, and gripped me, and I was terrified. And as a parent, I don't think I'm the only parent who has lost track of one of their children. But if you've experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the fact that we were in the middle of, of downtown Bangkok. Um, did I say Hong Kong earlier? It was, it, was, it was Bangkok. We were in downtown Bangkok. And to lose uh, your, little, your little boy in the midst of downtown Bangkok was a horrific thing. And those were the, the longest 10 minutes of my life. And we found him. But my point is, as parents, as loving mothers, as loving fathers, we keep an eye on our children. Uh, losing them is not something that we uh, typically do. With God, he never, ever loses track of one of his sons or one of his daughters. I love um, what the Bible says. Again, uh, Jesus said to his followers, he says, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has never, God has said, Never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. You know, many of us are moving into uncertain futures right now. We don't know what um, our future might look like. But the reality is that God is always present. And he's going to meet us in our future. He's already there. He has hold of us. And he will not lose track of us. God knows you intimately. He's with you constantly. And in verses 11 and 12, we see that God keeps us securely. He says, surely, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, God, for the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. God keeps us securely. At some point or another throughout our lives, we've all been afraid of the dark. We've all been afraid of the dark. And even to this day, you may sleep with a nightlight on of some sort. And it's the smallest of light, and yet it brings the biggest of comfort, doesn't it? What does light in the darkness do? It comforts us. It gives us assurance. It gives us confidence. It allows us to be directed because we can move toward that light. And what David is saying here is that as dark as it might get in your life, as dark as it may seem, as uncertain as the future might be, God says, I am holding on to you securely. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. In other words, God has a two-handed grip on you. God has a two-handed grip on you. You know, again, the analogy of being a parent to a little child when you're crossing the street, when you're um, anticipating some sort of danger, what do you do with your child? You take hold of their hand. And what Jesus is saying is, I have hold of you securely. And just in case you're concerned, my father has the other hand held securely. God has a two-handed grip on us. Even in the darkest of times, we can be assured that God is with us and God is holding on to us. And then the final reason is this, that God has created you uniquely. Verses 13 through 16. God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Did you hear the words that are used here to speak of how you came to be in existence? He, God knit you together. God has woven you together. Words like knit and woven do not speak to mass production. Each and every one of us are intricately and individually created by God. I believe this. You are not an afterthought to God. In fact, the Bible is saying here you were a forethought. Before even one of your days came to be, God knew you beforehand. God was thinking about you before you were. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, we read this. God is speaking to Jeremiah, and he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you. And he goes on to speak to Jeremiah about what his purpose would be. God has created you as a person, and he has created the purposes for you. We should be encouraged greatly by this fact that God has made each and every one of us uniquely. There is an intent behind your existence. God has created you with purpose in mind. You know, I was on the World Health Organization website um, this week, and I was looking at some different statistics, and one statistic that blew me away was the fact that throughout the world there's an estimated 56 million abortions every year. 56 million. I mean, the deaths related to COVID-19 seem beyond our abilities to comprehend. It's now around 300 and 65,000, 370,000 deaths, but 56 million abortions every year. That has to grieve the heart of God, I believe. You know, it also said that 50% of all pregnancies are unintentional. Well, there may be accidental parents, but I don't believe there's a single accidental child. Every single child, I believe, is uniquely crafted and uniquely created by God. And he has a purpose for each and every one. Again, I formed you in the womb. I knew you before you were born. And I set you apart. There are no accidental creations of God. This is a beautiful psalm. A beautiful psalm that speaks to the journey that we can enter into through relationship with God. So my question now is, so what is our response to this beauty? What is our response um, to how God um, sees us and how God has created us and how God um, interacts with us in our lives? And I've created a, uh, an acrostic here this morning. It spells the word acts, A C. T-S, and I want to give you four responses now that are also found in Psalm 139. I believe David's responses should be our responses. And the A stands for to be in awe of God, to be in awe of God. Verses 17 and 18, David writes, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. David is in awe of the fact that God takes thought of him, and we should be in awe of God as well. You know, we've lived in Brazil now almost seven years, and... Um, there's a phenomenon that goes on all around the world that's known as the Dawn Chorus. And it's a, something that's especially prevalent here in Brasilia. What is the Dawn Chorus? I don't know if any of you are aware what the Dawn Chorus is. Any of you sitting here this morning, you know what the Dawn Chorus is? 
Sharon knows. The dawn chorus, it takes place about a half hour before sunrise. And it's something within them that causes birds of all different types to begin singing. And usually I wake up to the dawn chorus every morning. I don't need an alarm because the birds of Brasilia wake me up most every morning. And it's amazing. And it is loud. And scientists have tried to figure out what prompts the birds to begin singing and they've thought well maybe it's a mating call of some sort maybe it's a means uh, by which to mark their territory but at the end of the day scientists have said we don't really know what prompts the dawn chorus other than the fact that birds were created to sing and they're fulfilling the purpose for which they were made I love that that not even scientists can figure out what makes a bird sing other than it's just part of who they are. Part of who we are as the creation of God is to be awed, to be in awe of God, to, to let that awe of him um, give birth to the song of our lips and the song of our lives. It's why we were created. Listen to Psalm 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We are to be awed by God and in awe of God. I believe it's why we were created. It's the fulfillment of our purpose, just like the birds singing, is for us to sing of God with our lives. So that's David's first response to the fact that God is intimately acquainted with him, that God's constantly with him, that God is holding him securely, and that um, God has created him uniquely. This is the awe of God. And then we come to verse 19 in this psalm, and I just have to tell you, it gets a little bit troubling here for the next few verses. Um, these verses and this psalm is known as one of the 11 imprecatory psalms. Now, what does imprecatory mean? Well, it means to call down a curse. And there's 11 different places in the psalms that are rather troubling, where the writer of those psalms begins to call down curses from God upon his enemies. Listen to where David goes in verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them, and I count them as enemies. Wow. What happened to loving the world and love your enemies and love your enemies as you, as you love yourselves? What are we supposed to do with these verses? Well, I think it's part of our response to God and to others. Do you hear the shift in David's tone? Do you hear the shift in his focus? Do you hear the shift all of a sudden in, in his, the content of what he's writing? He moves from this beautiful poetry um, being wrapped with who God is and everything is bright and light and loving and wonderful and and gracious and all of a sudden he shifts and that shift begins with the words if only if only God have you ever used the words if only God the words if only speak to a condition the words if only speak to being disappointed the C in the acrostic Acts here stands for to be content with God. You know, for the first 18 verses, David is completely content with who God is and who he is in God. But with the words, if only, 
he shifts his focus away from God and away from who he is. And he becomes, he begins making declarations that speak to the condition that he wants to put upon God. If only you would do this with my enemies. And I've done the same thing. I've said, if only God, you will do this, then I will obey you. If only God, you will do this, then I'll forgive. If only God, you will do this, then I'll do that. And we put conditions upon God and our relationship with God. We use the words if only to convey disappointment God, to God. You know, God, if only you'd allowed me to get that promotion. If only you'd allow me to have a child. If only you'd allow me to get married. If only is a dangerous place to go. And we're going to see that in a moment with, with David here. We need to learn to be content with God and with God alone. There need not be any if only God in our conversations with him. And Paul had to learn this. In Philippians 4, verse 12, I love what he writes. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. What happened in the moment at which David became discontented with God? His worship of God turned to worry. His faith in God turned to fear. And that's exactly what happens when we become discontented in our walk and in our journey with God. We need to remain and to learn contentment. It does not come naturally, does it? Paul said, I have had to learn to be content in every situation. It's not something that just came natural to him. And you can read of his life, and it speaks to being in great need, and it speaks to being uh, having everything that he needs. But Paul had learned the secret of what it meant to be content. So we need to be in awe of God. We need to be content with God. And then in verse 23, we see David speak to the fact that we need to be truthful before God. He, he moves on from this disappointment, and he invites God to examine him. And you can almost hear David rethinking the words that he's just spoken about his enemies. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. It's as if David is being prompted and realizing that he's gotten off the path that he needs to be on. And he invites God to search him and to examine him. He opens himself up to him. He's, God, if I'm being in offensive in how I'm speaking of my enemies, convict me of that. Let me be open to that. God, if I am wrongly taking a place of being disappointed in you and who you are and all that you've done for me, reveal that to me. Show that to me. Some of us need to have a confession session with God, and we need to invite him to examine our lives, to examine our hearts. You know, the reality is that all of us have blind spots, you know what a blind spot is when you're driving a vehicle? It's that, that car that's right next to you, though you don't see it there. And it potentially creates so much danger. It's an accident waiting to happen, right? Well, we all have similar uh, blind spots in our own lives, in, in our own character development as well. And we need to say, God, examine me and show me the blind spots. Show me where I'm being offensive to you. Show me where I'm being offensive to others. So the T stands for being truthful before God. That needs to be a continual response in our journey with God is, God, examine me. 
because I need you to reveal what is truth to me. And then the S stands for to be submitted to God. In verse 24, David concludes this psalm by writing, See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to be submitted to God's ways. At the end of the day, David is is saying, God, I don't want to be led by my own emotions. I don't want to be led by my own logic. I don't want to be led by my circumstances. I want to be led by you. I want you to have complete and total control over my life, over my day, over my steps. Because you know my thoughts from afar, I want you to have control of my mind. Because you know the words that I'm about to speak before I speak them, I want you to have control of my tongue and what it says today. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, You will be saved if you honestly say, Jesus is Lord, and if you believe with all your heart that God raised him from death. What does the word Lord mean? The word Lord speaks to the one who has authority over you. The word Lord speaks to the one who has control over you. That is what the Bible says allows us to be rescued by God, is when we submit ourselves to God, when we cry out to him and say, God, I want you to be Lord. God, I want you to be in control. And that's where David goes in the conclusion of this psalm. He submits himself. So we need to be in awe of God. We need to be contented with God. We need to be truthful before God. And then we need to be submitted to God. That ultimately needs to be our response. Jesus said, as followers of his, take up your cross daily and follow me. We need to put ourselves to death so that Christ might live in us. And this is a beautiful psalm, and I want to invite you to make this part of your daily Bible reading this week. Meditate on the words that are written and spoken here because it's God speaking to us who he is and the relationship that he wants to have with us and the response that we need to give to him. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that as we call you Lord, we would not do so casually. I pray that we would do so intentionally. And God, I pray that you would examine our hearts, that you would know our minds, and that you would lead us in everlasting ways, that you would lead us to love our enemies, not hate our enemies, that you would lead us to see people with your heart, that you would lead us to be compassionate as you are compassionate that you would lead us to embrace the purposes for which you have created us. God, we are so grateful that you never leave us, that you never turn your back on us. We are so grateful that you hold us, that you have created us to know us intimately. Lord, I pray that this week, as we move into our Monday, that we would seek you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. In Jesus' name we pray.